there is a, a trend happening with the Republicans and it's if you can't beat them, cheat them. The Republicans know very clearly that they don't have the majority. The majority of Americans are not with them. We got to address the suburban women problem because it's real. Welcome to the Suburban Women Problem, a podcast from Red, Wine, and Blue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening. I'm Amanda Weinstein, and you're listening to a special episode of the Suburban Women Problem. I know we said that the hosts were taking a summer break this August, but we are doing this special bonus episode to remind you of an important election on August 8th that could alter Ohio's state constitution and threaten our reproductive rights. Today, I'm excited to share my interview with Congresswoman Chantel Brown of Ohio. But first, let me explain what is going on in Ohio. We have a special election and the final day to vote is next Tuesday, August 8th. But you don't have to wait to vote until Tuesday. You can vote right now and early voting will continue all weekend long. We'll put a link in the show notes for everyone to find out where and when to vote. This election is to ensure that a simple majority can pass a ballot measure and a no vote will protect that simple majority. So let me introduce our guests and we can get into more of the details on this special election. Our guest today is Congresswoman Chantel Brown of Ohio's 11th Congressional District. She was elected to Congress in 2021, but has spent over a decade in public service. She is a lifelong proud resident of Cleveland and a fierce advocate for women's rights. Congresswoman Brown, welcome to the Suburban Women Problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so glad you could join us. So first off, Let's talk about why we are having this special election in August in Ohio. Didn't the Republicans just vote to do away with special elections in August? That is correct. Uh, at least that's what I thought. So I think that there is a, a trend happening with the Republicans. And it's if you can't beat them, cheat them. Oh, oh I like that <laughs> slogan. Yeah. So what is going on with this August special election and how is this connected to reproductive rights in Ohio state constitution? Well, I, I want to say this. Um, the, the issue one is so, so critically important. And mm -hmm. when we think about Ohio and when we think about the importance of protecting women's right to make their own health care decisions, because it, to me, abortion is one thing, but this really boils down to us being able to make our own health care decisions. So when we talk about this uh, issue one and it raising the threshold from a simple majority to a super majority, it's going from 51 50 percent plus one to 60 percent. And that is not a mistake. That is not a coincidence. That is not happenstance. Um, it's calculated. About, it's very calculated <laughs> because when you think about some of the other states that had this very same initiative on the ballot, like Kansas and Michigan, um, Kansas, which is considered a red state, uh, Michigan, which is notably a swing state, these initiatives passed by 56 percent and 59 percent respectively. So this 60 percent threshold, as you said, is very, very calculated. So when we talk talk about Ohio and they're they're changing um, the rules <laughs> again, because if you can't beat them, cheat them, um, we're trying to change the rules in the middle of the game, which has been something they've been doing for quite some time and getting away with it, even in my very own situation, having to run on unconstitutional maps. So that is um, largely in part why this issue is so critically important to Ohioans. Wow. So is this just Ohio or is this part of a larger Republican playbook? I think it's part of a larger Republican playbook. I mean, uh, you know, I, as a member of Congress, the um, the hollow halls still ring and still have an an aura, an era of what happened on Jerry, January 6th that mm -hmm. still affects some of my colleagues to this day. Um, we had probably one of the largest exodus, if you will, um, this last midterm election where some members just decided not to uh, return and others decided to run for other offices because of what happened on January 6th. And I think that was the um, initial 
uh, demonstration of the playbook, if you will, of if you can't beat them, then cheat them. The, the stealing of the, the quote unquote stealing of the election and the insurrection that happened on January 6th is a result of that. And I see it continuing to play out throughout the country and it's being launched through crazy initiatives uh, all over the all over the country. When you think about the voting rights mm -hmm. um, legislation that have been passed over the last uh a uh, couple of years to the tune of 400 pieces of legislation in over 49 states to suppress the vote. It is a very real thing. I love that you link this back to January 6th. Well, love and hate it, but I love that you tied it because it is part of a larger playbook that the Republicans know very clearly that they don't have the majority. The majority of Americans are not with them. So the only way they can win is by going around the majority and by completely getting rid of democracy at the federal level, January 6th, down to the state level, what Ohio is doing in our August election right now. In Ohio, when we think about um, when we think about elections and, and what a no vote would mean for issue one, um, it, it, it essentially means maintaining that majority rule, right? Otherwise, if we vote yes, it will be um, 40 percent of the voters will have control. They can block any issue um, and, and gives 40 percent the majority <laughs> of a, the, the decision making authority, which is insane. It just sounds crazy to me. Um, a no vote would also uh, protect our uh our ability to, while the other side likes to say it's protecting the Constitution, I guess it depends on what side of the Constitution you're on. <laughs> because if a, a yes vote would permanently um, undo constitutional protections that have been in place for over 100 years, allowing a checks and balance system, which would give uh, citizens the opportunity to uh, take control when politicians fail to do so. If citizens don't like the decisions that their politicians are making, Right now, we have the ability to do something about it. Issue one would prevent us from doing that. So it really does protect our freedom and it allows for the power of one person, one vote to remain true. But if issue one passes, that will no longer be the case. Again, we will be giving our power to the minority. 40% of the voters will have the ability to decide on any constitutional amendment moving forward. Issue one is really kind of asking, do you want to give your voice over to Columbus and to the politicians that are there? And it really does take away the voice of the people when they decide they want to do something or do something differently than how the politicians are voting right now. And so voting no is really saying, no, I don't wanna give my voice over to them for any issue. And right now, one of the pressing issues in Ohio is reproductive freedom. But what other issues are they really afraid of other than reproductive freedom? Well, I would say, um, as a person who had to run on unconstitutional maps, gerrymandering. Um, you know, Absolutely. we've already we've already said no to that. And um, despite despite the Supreme Court last year instructing um, the state legislator state legislation to uh, redraw the maps, we have run on maps that were deemed unconstitutional. And this initiative is ultimately silencing the, vo the voice of the voters. So it means that there is some value there. So we have to pay mm -hmm. attention and make sure that we are protecting the power that we have and protecting the freedom and the democracy. But gerrymandering is one of those issues. Reproductive freedom is one of those issues. And I would go as far as to say um, even something like uh, raising the minimum wage is one of those uh, grassroots citizen-led initiatives that could be adversely impacted um, if issue one passes. Oh, well said. And that gerrymandering, those maps, I mean, you're talking about the people that we send to Congress, the people that we send to Washington, D.C., that is affecting our entire nation, that this is you know, a really important issue, not just for people in Ohio, but for our democracy in general. That is very that's a that's a that's a great point. And I and I would be remiss if I didn't add this. Issue one, not only will it increase the uh, the threshold from 51 to 60 percent, but it also um, will increase the requirement to get these initiatives on the ballot before we even get to mm -hmm. that next step step of 60 percent. So mm -hmm. right now in Ohio, we're only required to get signatures in 44 of the 88 counties. If issue one passes, all 88 counties. We would have to get signatures for all from all 88 counties. So what that one means, county could stop it. One county could stop it. So you recently said reproductive rights are inextricably linked to the health of our democracy overall. 
So can you expand on that for our listeners? Absolutely. So I think first we have to look at the big picture. Um, what makes a healthy democracy, right? And that's equal rights and equal protection under the law. These Republicans know that people are supportive of women being able to make their own health care decisions. And this issue one inevitably is going to take away the power of the majority and put the power in the hands of a 30 percent minority. And that is not democracy. That is not a sign. And that is not a characteristic of a healthy democracy. It is not. So here at Red, Wine and Blue, we love friend to friend organizing because we know that voters are more likely to listen to their friends, family and neighbors than a TV ad or mailer. What do you tell your friends to encourage them to get out the vote? Too many people feel like, oh, my vote doesn't count or it doesn't matter. And I just have to remind them um, that every vote really does matter. And I am actually um, a, a living uh, example. My, my very first race, um, I, I ran and I was when the polls closed, I was down by six votes. And I actually... <laughs> Yes, I actually thought that a lot, but it's not a lot. And so I actually thought I lost the race and I was ready to move on my, with my life. I'm a child of faith, so I wasn't shy. I was like, okay, this is God's infinite wisdom. Whatever he has for me, I'm okay with that. So, but what I didn't know, there were 23 provisional ballots in my race and I wasn't as, <laughs> right. And so those are just in case ballots for people who are may not be as politically savvy as you are. Um, and I call them just in case ballots because it's just in case you requested an absentee ballot that didn't show up in time or just in case you've moved and you're not at your um, right polling location and want to make sure you aren't trying to vote twice. So they don't count these provisional ballots unless they're necessary, um, because if I only there were only five in my race, it would not have changed the outcome. Right. But there were 23 and they count them 10 days after the election day. So. 11 days later. <laughs> you had to wait for 10 days. And, but this, the craziest part is I had no idea I was this was even a thing because I was I was like a young activist just trying to run to, to yes. make a difference in my community. So I didn't even know. But other people who were more politically savvy, they said, it's not over. And I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And they're like, it's not over. Just, just give it some time. And I'm like, okay. And the funny part about that is I actually probably registered about five new voters. <laughs> but I ended up so I ended up winning by seven votes, long story short. So seven yes, votes. Seven votes. Every vote seven matters. Votes. Every vote really does count. And so people close to me know that story. Um, so they know they also know that um I check their voting uh status. That is public information for those who you Ooh, I like know. that. Yeah, so I am one that will if I if you have if you know a person's last name and birth date, their voting record. <gasps> As public, they, you can't tell how they voted, but you can yes, tell just if like if they're voted. registered to vote. If they, oh, ooh. yeah. So I am on my family and friends. I'm like, hey, early voting started. Uh, when are you gonna vote? And so I have become such a nag over the years. Like yes. almost all of my family goes to vote, and my friends they go vote early. So on election day, they're free to either work the polls or help other people um, get to the polling locations uh, if they don't have transportation. So <laughs> oh, nice. I mean, so that sounds like a great thing that people can do to help this effort. So if we're in Ohio right now, right, so we can help, you know, ask people, are you registered? Are you ready to vote? Have you already voted? Do you have a plan to vote? What else can people in Ohio do? You can call, you can text. Um, you if you don't if you don't have a yard sign, put a sign in your yard. You know, get, get, those are the little things that matter because it's a signal to your friends and neighbor where you stand. And to your point, people trust their friends and their neighbors. And so if they see, they see a sign in your yard, or if they get a phone call or a text from you, that will go a long way. Um, so don't underestimate the power of your circle of influence. And please, please, please use it because this is going to have, this could potentially have um, long lasting impacts on our uh, future, just not only in the state of Ohio, but as you pointed out, when we, we take into consideration the maps that we run on for the congressional races, but even um, our state uh, our state representatives and state senates, they are impacted by these uh, gerrymander maps. And so it has an impact on the people that are representing you. It will keep the power in the people's hands and not allow politicians and special interest groups to make decisions for you. So you also co-sponsored the 2023 Women's Health Protection Act in Congress. So can you tell us what would this bill do and how can we help you get this bill passed? 
but it would just enshrine and protect women's right to abortion care across the country. And so to help me pass it again, in order to change the laws, we have to change the lawmakers, right? And so mm -hmm. we have to get more women. Um, <laughs> yes. More women this, right? Um, the sad thing is that a lot of these uh, decisions that are being imposed on us, uh, the majority of them are being made by um, old white men who do not have <laughs> much experience. They, they don't have much experience with a uterus. Right? <laughs> Exactly. And so it's really it's really unfair um, on so many levels. So as a woman and as a minority, um, it's doubly impactful um, for me to be able to uh, give women the opportunity to get the um, help and care and health care that they need. Oh, that's so important. So this has been so great. But before I let you go, we are going to do our rapid fire questions. Are you uh -oh. ready, Chantel? <laughs> We buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> All right. What will you do to celebrate if issue one is voted down? Um, I'm going to be so thrilled that I'm just going to jump right in and start working on November. I'm going to, you know, maintain that momentum because we have got uh, some amazing elections coming up in November 2024. Um, our presidential re-election, uh, the re-election of my cousin, Senator Sherrod Brown. <laughs> so we oh, want to make sure we, <laughs> we want to make sure we get him <laughs> back in office. And we've also got uh, some Supreme Court justices of our own that could be um, that might Ooh. be returned on the ballot. And uh, just and Justice Melody Stewart, as well as Justice Donnelly, they would be back on the ballot in 2024. So I think this issue one um, election could be a good barometer for what we can expect in 2024. And so far, I'm pretty excited. So a little champagne too, but I'm getting right to it. <laughs> little bubbly. I love it. A little bubbly and a little getting down to some more work. That's right. So as a lifelong resident of Cleveland, I have to ask, what is your favorite thing about Cleveland? Mm, the culture. I know that's a kind of a broad answer, but I mean, it covers everything. I mean, from arts to the people, to the music, to the food. I love everything. I'm a native, as you um, pointed out, born and raised. I'm like uh, Wonder Bread. Like I've just, I'm, I'm, I've been here for my whole life and I, and I love it. And I love all of the amazing amenities that we have, we are so mm. underrated. And when people come here, they're like, Agreed. they're surprised. I yeah, know. They are surprised. My family, when I finally convinced them to come out here every single time, they're surprised. Like, oh, oh, I didn't yes. know this was what Cleveland was affordable, like. Right? Affordable housing. We've got we've got the lake. We've got three major sports teams. I mean, we, we, we got it going on. So, you know, I love it. Agree. So what has been the most surprising thing about being a member of Congress? Oh, um, two things I would say. And I shouldn't have been so surprised, but the par the partisanship, like the party partisanship mm. is hardcore. Mm. It is very hardcore. Um, but the other thing is just the amount of things that are crammed into the days. Like our days oh, are yes. incredibly long. Um, I'll, I'll share a little bit of a private a moment that I had with the president and he said to me, he's like, Congress is so much easier than council. And I have to disagree. <laughs> 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 the demands, like my day starts sometime at 7 a.m. and sometimes they don't end until 10, you know, often. Oh. Yeah. So we cram a lot into our three days. We have committees that run sometimes simultaneously. There are caucus meetings constantly, and I'm on multiple caucuses. So the demand on your time once you get, th get there is extremely intense. And, and even with um, my predecessor who set the expectations very realistically for me, that still caught me by surprise. Wow. I know. It's even interesting, like with the partisanship where they seat you, like very clear delineation <laughs> of like, and yeah. I often wondered, like, maybe we should change the seating, like mix a sprinkle, mix right? It up a little bit. And it's not, yeah. and it's even, it's on committees, it's on the floor. So it is everywhere. It is, it's real. Yes. Interesting. All right. What's the most important thing for everyone listening from Ohio to do right now to help get out the vote by August 8th? Call somebody. Take somebody, um, take somebody to the polls. The polls are open till seven. Uh, the boarding, the board of elections is open until seven. Your local polling location will be open until seven thirty on election day. So right now, if you haven't voted, go vote, and then on election day, you'll be free to do other stuff to help get the vote out for others on election day. That's right. I love to say stuff happens. You never know what's going to happen yeah. on election day. Get it done now. Yes. 
And it's so quick and easy. It's the only thing it's on the ballot. It's very quick and easy. It's, right. it's literally less than five minutes. Only one thing, vote no. Vote <laughs> no. All right. That is the end of our rapid fire questions. Where can people go to find out more about you and your work? The easiest way is to uh, follow me at Rep Chantel Brown. Uh, that's my on the unofficial side. Oh, that's the official side at Rep Chantel Brown. And then on the unofficial side, just Chantel Brown. So awesome. It's been so great talking to you today. Thanks for joining me on this special episode of the Suburban Women Problem. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. If you live in Ohio, don't forget to vote no by next Tuesday, August 8th. Some polling places have changed, so make sure you check your polling location. You can vote early today, Saturday, and Sunday. There is no early voting on Monday, and then polls will be open for a final day on Tuesday from 6.30 a.m. until 7.30 p.m. And make sure you ask your friends and family to vote too. And if you aren't in Ohio, remember that you can still help us get out the vote this weekend. You can sign up and get trained at go.redwine.blue slash pb6. Just a reminder, we are on a break from our normal episodes, but please check out our special podcast, The Cost of Extremism, available in this feed. We'll return next month for more episodes of The Suburban Women Problem. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstenson, and our project manager is Lindsay Quist. Videos by Abigail Martin and Ashley Hufford. For more information about upcoming events and trainings, or to learn more about Red, Wine, and Blue, follow us on social media or at www.redwine.blue.